Ah, uh, Super Mario Kart for the SNES. Such a nice, simple, relaxing game to kick back with your friends like it's good old 1992. But for some people, just playing the game isn't enough. If you're like me, you want to know what makes this game tick. How all of its nitty gritty secrets connect to make the game a masterpiece. Or maybe you're wondering why the game feels so weird to play. Or why it seems like people seem to adore this game while you just can't seem to get into it. Well, you've come to the right place. In this series, I'll be diving into the deep end of Super Mario Kart and covering everything this game has to offer, from the AI to the items, speedrunning strategies, glitches, why certain tech works, how the game manages data, clever tricks developers use to get around technical limitations, covering beta content, sounds, you name it. I've personally spent the better half of the last five or six years researching this game, and the common consensus is that not very many people really know what's going on when it comes to this game, and I for one want to change that. Hopefully, by the end of this series, I can have a reasonable set of informational videos that will help people learn about Super Mario Kart, and the SNES in general. Today's topic is one I'm sure many people are very curious about, Super Mario Kart's AI. Surprisingly, this is a very simple topic, but it can get complicated very fast if you're not careful. But don't worry, OL's got you covered, and I'll do my best to help you understand it. So let's get started. So how does the AI control system work in Super Mario Kart? To explain, let's take a look at Bowser here. Each racer stores a lot of data, but for the purposes of this explanation, only a few things are important. Each racer keeps track of the current direction they are facing, which I usually represent with a blue line like this, the direction to their next target, which I represent with a white line, and the racer's current momentum, represented by the green line. However, in terms of AI steering, the momentum direction and the facing direction are exactly the same so we can ignore the facing direction for now since the momentum is what is used for the calculations. This isn't always the case, however, especially when it comes to player-controlled racers, but I'll discuss that in more detail another time, as player controls are out of the scope of this video. The AI steering is actually very simple. If the target direction is to the right of the momentum direction, the AI will turn right. If the target direction is to the left of the momentum direction, the AI will turn left. Super simple, right? Let's take a look at it in action. Here we can see some weird behavior. The target destination keeps jumping around at weird times. Why is that? Well, this has to do with one of the most important features of Super Mario Kart, the zone system. Internally, Super Mario Kart keeps a map of zone or checkpoint tiles indicating which parts of the map belong to which checkpoints. This system is used for many different purposes, including calculating the racer ranks, CPU finishing times, calculating target locations, and... Although we don't care about all this other stuff right now, so let's focus on the target calculation. When a racer enters a certain zone, the game checks the zone number and looks at the target coordinates from a table stored in memory. This target coordinate is then used to calculate the target direction. As the racer enters a new zone, the current zone number is updated, and the corresponding target is calculated again. Actually, this calculation is done every frame, which can be a problem if this method of calculating the target direction is slow. Hint hint, it is. I'll discuss the actual calculation in a supplemental video, but for now, all you need to know is that this calculation is slow. To fix this, the developers of Super Mario Kart implemented an optimization, the flow map. This is one of many common trade-offs between computation speed and memory usage. Similarly to the zone map, the flow map represents what the target direction will be on every given tile in the zone map. This is all pre-calculated when the map is being loaded, so none of these calculations happen during the race itself. Since this map is a lookup table, obtaining the target direction is a very fast operation, but it does have one drawback. The flow map can only be generated where there are valid checkpoint tiles. When the AI is not on one of these tiles, they must resort to using the stored target coordinates and calculating the direction with the slow calculation. This is usually not an issue and occurs mainly when the AI is hit by an item, or when some prodding fool makes a tool that allows them to pick up objects in game and move them around. What? As a quick aside, most of the time, the target coordinate is inside the bounds of the next zone in the sequence, but split paths sometimes break these rules, like in Ghost Valley 1, Bowser Castle 2 and 3, Koopa Beach 1, Rainbow Road, and even Chaco Island 2. Though it doesn't seem like there's any split paths, the large mud pit is technically a split path as a remnant of beta versions of the track during development. 
but the rule is that the target coordinate should end up in the bounds of a new checkpoint so you always are able to update the target. Along these split paths, the checkpoints alternate between each path. This is done to keep the ranking system at least somewhat accurate. This is just the simplest way to compromise between all the different functions of the checkpoints, and is partially why I refer to them as checkpoints, while most documentation refers to these as zones. Let's take a look at some examples in Bowser Castle 3. Along the left side here, the path first diverges into two lanes, and then into a third one near the bottom. The order of these checkpoints is stored internally from left to right along the split paths. Left first, then middle, and then right. The second section of split paths near the end of the track has kind of a weird order. In the horizontal section, the three checkpoints are ordered from top to bottom, while along the thin sections, they are again ordered from left to right. Also, there's a very tiny part of the track that is not covered by the zones. I already showed Bowser Castle 2, so let's just take a look at Ghost Valley 1 here. Also, Bowser Castle 2 is just a mess and will be discussed more another time. One last thing in terms of steering. Super Mario Kart attempts to have the AI avoid collisions with the players. When an AI is getting ready to overtake the player, a slight repelling force is given to the AI to tell it to steer away from the player. This kinda works, but it's not super noticeable unless you are looking out for it. Here, let's follow Bowser as he overtakes the player, Mario, along the straightaway. Did you catch it? Here, I'll play it back again, but I'll show you how the path changes. Hopefully that shows you the effect of the repelling force. But did you notice that Toad didn't get repelled? Yeah. This repelling force is dependent on the distance from the AI to the player. But there's a little more to it. Let's do some guided experiments and rebuild the system ourselves. Alright, so we start with our player here, Mario, and our AI, Bowser. Bowser's a nice guy and doesn't want to hit Mario when passing him on the left. For the purposes of this explanation, I'll use a left side overtake, but the same ideas will work for a right side overtake. When Bowser sees that he's within some distance of Mario, he'll turn left. As long as he's within that distance, he'll keep trying to turn left to avoid Mario. A quick note, when I say turn left, what the game is actually doing is adding a vector to the momentum. So it's not exactly turning left as much as it is adding a linear force to Bowser. If you're not sure why that's an important distinction, don't worry too much. For now it's okay to think of this conceptually as turning rather than what the actual physics are. Anyway, let's run our little system and see how it turns out. Okay, that doesn't look like what we saw earlier at all. What gives? Well, one issue is that even though Bowser was in front of Mario, he still kept turning. It would make more sense if Bowser stopped turning after he passed. For now, I'll leave this as a little hand-wavy magic, but just know there's a pretty simple way to tell if an object is in front of the player or behind them, which we'll go over in another episode where that magic is more relevant. So let's run our experiment again and see if it looks right. Kinda. We're getting close. It just looks like Bowser is still turning too much. There's a couple ways we can fix this, but let's think about this for a second. If Bowser's already far enough away from Mario to overtake him, shouldn't he stop turning? And if he's really close to Mario, shouldn't he turn a lot harder than if he's further away? Alright, a little more hand-waving here, but let's make a function that says how hard Bowser should turn based on how far he is away from Mario. Now, let's apply this distance-based repulsion and see how it goes. Ah, beautiful. Something to note is that this graph is not the only one that's used. In fact, there's a second one that is reserved specifically for when driving on Ghost Valley and Rainbow Road, since there are edges to those tracks and you don't want to turn too much. There are a couple minor caveats to this system, which I describe in further detail in the description if you're interested in that sort of thing. Awesome, so we finally understand how the AI steering works. We're all good to go, right? Hold it! We haven't talked about speed controls. Fortunately, the concept for how AI speed works is extremely simple. Unfortunately, the nuances start to get in the way, 
So I'll give a conceptual basis in this video, and in the next episode in the series, I'll discuss the rivalry system in more detail. AKA how Super Mario Kart is a cheating son of a bitch. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. Ah, right, back to speed control. Remember these weird colors over the zones? Let's talk about those. Similarly to the target calculation system, the game stores a table of what each zone's speed setting is. This table works in exactly the same way that the target table does. These speed settings are used to select what the top speed of the AI should be when in that zone. From slowest to fastest, we have the green, yellow, orange, and red zones. This is just my convention, and you'll see different conventions out there if you do more research. This value is combined with the rivalry factor in order to select the speed the racer should be going at. Okay, okay, that deserves some more explanation. But like I said, the core concept is that simple. The issue comes down to how these speeds are set, how rivalries, CC, and even your performance as a player affects these speeds. But for that, you'll have to wait till the next episode of Super Mario Kart Under the Hood. Thank you so much for watching. If there were any portions you weren't able to understand, don't worry, it gets a lot worse. Just kidding. If you didn't quite catch something the first time, feel free to stop and think about it for a second then go and watch the part again. I tried to keep the concepts in this episode as approachable as I could without losing too much of what's important. But if you think I should go into more detail or more in depth, please let me know in the comments as there is a ton I could talk about, even in just in terms of making the AI turn left and right. It does take a lot of effort to create things like this, where I delve into a topic and make it more approachable for a wider audience, which is why I'd like to thank my patrons on Patreon for helping me make this video a reality. If you enjoyed this video and would like me to be able to put more time and effort into these kinds of things, consider becoming a patron. At any level of support, as little as a dollar per month, you'll also get your name included in the end of the video, like you see all these wonderful people here. You'll also be able to access these videos a week before they're released to the public. Otherwise, if you did enjoy, please be sure to like and subscribe and follow me on Twitter. It really helps me know that you want to see more. Happy karting, and I'll see you all next time under the hood.